Hey everyone, today we are going to take a look at how the brand new ASUS ROG Ally X performs when we combine it with the cheap $100 Thunderbolt eGPU enclosure I tested a while ago. And the results are a bit weird, to say the least. So let's talk about that. This is Hubwood. Since ASUS decided to give the ROG Ally X not one but two USB-C ports, with one of them being a USB 4 port, I wanted to test it with my Thunderbolt 4 eGPU, which is in fact compatible to USB 4, and see how that turns out. The Viking Goo eGPU I used can be acquired on AliExpress for as cheap as $100 on sales. For this test, I assembled it with a used 450 watt System Power 7 PCU by Be Quiet, and for the GPUs, I used an old MSI GTX 1070Ti, which you can actually get for as cheap as around $100 or even less, used on eBay these days, as well as my personal Palit RTX 4070. To get things running, you'll just have to plug in the eGPU while the LIX is turned off, switch it on and then turn the LIX on as well. After installing the most recent NVIDIA drivers, you're basically good to go. I was also deactivating the internal AMD Radeon just in case, but I'm not sure if that's really necessary. Keep in mind to have your Windows BitLocker recovery key available, which you can find on aka.ms.myrecoverykey as the LIX was asking me for that whenever I switched between the iGPU and the eGPU and unfortunately I haven't been able to find a workaround for that yet other than disabling the BitLocker encryption in the LIX, which I would not really recommend due to safety issues. So however, once I had it up and running, I was connecting the external GPU directly to my capture card via HDMI to achieve a better performance than when I was plugging in the HDMI cable in the JSOX USB hub I used for today's test. For my benchmarks, I was setting the LIX to turbo mode for the best CPU performance. All drivers and the BIOS have been up to date and for the tests without the eGPU, I was setting the VRAM size of the LIX to 8GB while I was reducing that to only 1GB for when I was using the eGPU. Before we jump into the gaming benchmarks, let's have a look at the synthetic 3D Mark results first. For 3D Mark Fire Strike, the LIX scored 6929, which is a bit less than what a desktop system with a GTX 1650 can achieve. Using the GTX 1070 Ti, the score was already much higher with 16,292 and 28,436 with the RTX 4070, whereas my desktop system with a Ryzen 7 7700X achieves 35,816 in that test. So far, so good. In Times Spy, I saw similar results with 3,260 for the LIX and its Z1 Extreme. 6,695 with the GTX 1070 Ti installed in the eGPU casing and 14,231 with the RTX 4070, whereas my desktop system is only slightly faster with 16,800 points using said same RTX 4070. And for the new Steel Nomad Lite benchmark, the LIX only scores 2,637 points, whereas with the eGPU and the GTX 1070 Ti, it's already 6,285. Using the RTX 4070, the difference was quite huge this time with 16,360. And my desktop PC only being around 8% faster than that with 17,718 points. In the integrated benchmark of Assassin's Creed Valhalla at medium settings, the eGPU with the GTX 1070 Ti was around 31% faster than the Radeon 780M in the Z1 Extreme, while the 1070 Ti did have severe stuttering issues, causing really bad 1% lows as you can see in the frame time graph. Using the RTX 4070 actually improved the result by more than 100% and the 1% lows have been fine as well. The GTX 1070 Ti seems to be almost fully utilized in this test, while it was only running with 113 watt. The RTX 4070 was kinda bored with only around 60 to 70 percent usage and a power draw of only 90 watt, while it still seemed to be running at its full clock speed. In the Cyberpunk 2077 benchmark at medium settings with FSR on quality, I saw similar results considering the usage of the cards. 
The GTX 1070 Ti was exactly 50% faster than the LIX when using the Radeon 780M with now 63 FPS, while the RTX 4070 was able to achieve around 95% more FPS in this test with 82 FPS on average over only 42 FPS for the LIX without the eGPU attached. The 1% lows seem to be fine in all three cases. In Diablo 4, something really weird happened. At 1080p and the medium preset with FSR on balance, the RTX 4070 actually performed worse than the GTX 1070 Ti for whatever reason. And I double and triple checked that and switched the GPUs around again to be sure. It still performed a bit better than the Z1 Extreme, but not anywhere near a performance we would expect from Diablo 4 with such a fast GPU. It also seems to struggle using its maximum clock speed and only ran at a measly 50 watt on average and only 5000 MHz for the reram instead of 10,000. So maybe there is some issue with the drivers or the game. And I also want to point out that with the RTX 4070, the 1% lows have been a bit lower as well. And that was really weird and quite disappointing. In the Forza Horizon 5 benchmark, at the high preset, the 1070 Ti didn't manage to perform noticeably better than the Z1 Extreme. Only around 4 FPS more this time. Not worth the struggle at all. The 4070 performed 47% better, though again that's much less than expected and most certainly not worth the upgrade as well, considering this card costs around 500 to 550 right now, even though it was able to run at its design specifications, except for the power usage, which was pretty low once more with only around 83 watt. But for some reason the game was actually unplayable when I was using the RTX 4070 as it suffered from severe rubber banding like stuttering every once in a while which caused the 4070 benchmark to run out of sync after a while. You can also see that in the frame time graph every few seconds or so and it really becomes unplayable. I tried it besides the benchmark run. In Fortnite I was using the replay feature for a better comparability and here the upgrades kind of seem to make more sense at low settings with medium shadows, epic view distance and 100% resolution scaling. The GTX 1070 Ti was more than 100% faster and the RTX 4070 more than 200%. The 1% lows seem to be fine as well, so it could actually make kind of sense in this case. Though, I think an RTX 3060 would be just fine as well. While you can get one of these for around $270 new and between $200 and $250 on the used market for the 12GB version. Here the two Nvidia cards were able to pull a bit more power and the GTX 1070 Ti even seemed to be almost fully utilized. For Hogwarts Legacy, I was using my usual benchmark run through the Forbidden Forest and the results have once more been quite disappointing. The GTX 1070 Ti was only 38% faster and the RTX 4070 only 55% faster while being quite bored with only 50% usage. Though here it could actually make sense to use an RTX 4000 series card to activate frame generation for quite some extra performance and even allowing you to use ultra settings with around 100 fps at 1080p and you could even probably play it at 1440p. The performance gain was much better in Shadow of the Tomb Raider using DirectX 12 and high settings. The GTX 1070 Ti in the eGPU casing was able to achieve a 117% better performance with now very neat 89 fps though the RTX 4070 was not that much faster with an improvement of 156% with its 105 FPS on average. Once more, the GTX 1070 Ti seemed to be almost fully utilized while almost using its maximum wattage. In Starfield, I was running through the first bigger city in the game using the low preset with activated FSR and frame generation. Here the GTX 1070 Ti once again was almost on par with the Z1 Extreme with a plus of only 4 FPS while the RTX 4070 was able to achieve 123 FPS, an improvement of 83%. While it was quite weird that it reported to be almost fully utilized according to the MSI Afterburner OSD. And it seems as if the GTX 1070 Ti was able to achieve slightly smoother frame times than the RTX 4070, while in all three cases it's quite playable. 
though it would probably make more sense to use higher settings in that case of the RTX 4070 as the Set1 Extreme seems to become a bottleneck here and we would want to take away some load from the CPU. In The Last of Us I was using the medium preset with FSR on balance and the GTX 1070 Ti performed only 16% better compared to the Z1 Extreme while the RTX 4070 was at least able to get 91% more FPS. And again, the RTX 4070 could activate frame generation to get much better results even with higher or ultra settings or even using 1440p for sure while still getting 60 FPS or more. While it once again was using quite less wattage than it could. And before we take a look at 4K gaming with the RTX 4070, let's have a look at Baldur's Gate 3, which behaved super weird and disappointing. Running through the city in Act 3 at the medium preset with FSR on quality, the eGPU seemed to be a super hard bottleneck as both Nvidia cards actually performed worse than the LIX all by itself, while they also suffered from severe stuttering making the game quite less enjoyable for whatever reason. Probably the engine or whatever. And just for fun, I was also testing Cyberpunk 2077 at 4K with the ray tracing preset on medium in combination with DLSS on balanced and frame generation activated. This resulted in quite low but well kind of playable 38 FPS on average and the GPU was a bit more utilized than in most of the previous tests while also pulling more from the wall. But it could do a bit better than that on a desktop PC. And then deactivating ray tracing while keeping the rest of the settings at ultra didn't actually really help that much with only around 11 FPS more. But I guess with 1440p, 60 FPS could be achievable on the RTX 4070, even when using this eGPU over the LIX. So what's my conclusion? I guess it kinda really depends on the games you play as well as the settings and the resolution. And the outcome could really be good or just plainly disappointing like for Baldur's Gate 3 or Diablo 4. I mean, it's a good thing that Asus listened to people and used USB 4. But if you really need more stationary power, you could go for the cheaper original ROG Ally and get the official um, Asus ROG XG dock, which has less of a bottleneck thanks to its better throughput, but of course this dock itself is much more expensive. But now we kind of have the choice at least. It's just that the 40 gigabits per second limitation through the Thunderbolt cable will bottleneck desktop GPUs pretty hard, especially the faster ones. I think it wouldn't make a lot of sense to throw in something more powerful than like an RTX 3060 or 4060 or an AMD RX 6650 perhaps, for a total of then around $300 to $400 altogether with an eGPU and a used PSU, if you're playing mostly games that actually benefit from it. I bet I could test like 100 games and the outcome would really be totally different for each game. And that's all for today. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and or subscribe to the channel. I'm going to test the brand new AMD iGPU, the Radeon 890M, in the new AMD Ryzen AI 9 HX370 mobile CPU really soon in a lot of games, so don't miss that. Thanks for watching, see you next time, bye bye and tschüss.